so in this talk, I'm going to discuss about the using multi-camera system to measure the three-dimensional motion of the birds in the field. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to show you that by improving the uh, measurement accuracy, we are able to measure both not only the body motion, but also the wind motion of the birds in the field. And uh, this work is a collaboration work between three different universities. Uh, and it is sponsored by Human Frontier Science Program. So uh, this, uh, using multi-camera system to track the motion of the birds has been used in many years. But the, uh, the problem is that uh, the distance between camera is uh, relatively short uh, compared to the distance of the birds uh, to the camera. And uh, as a result, uh, the, red, the image measurement accuracy in the, in the direction perpendicular to the imaging plane is relatively low. So in, the, in, the, in most of the previous work, people have just treated the birds as a single point. They are not able to measure the wind motion. So uh, the purpose of our study is that we are, we are going to develop a system that is able to overcome the distance barrier between the cameras so that we are able to improve the measurement accuracy in all three directions. And uh, I'm going to show you that by doing this, how we can measure both the body motion and the wind motion. So uh, this is a, our simple experiment setup. So because in, if, if, you work, if you want to work in the field, it's very important to make the system very portable. So we actually ap apply the USB cameras. So those cameras can be both powered and controlled through a, through a single laptop. So we're using four cameras. Each two camera is uh, uh, controlled by a one, one laptop. And uh, in, in this experiment setup, so the, is, uh, uh, the camera is looking into the sky, and the bird is flying at a height about 50 meters height. So in, we, we set our cameras, uh, set uh, the distance into 50, 50 to 60 meters. But in, uh, in some other system, when the bird is flying even higher, we, we are able to extend the distance even further. And uh, so uh, as you see here, this is a sample image. We, we capture from the image when the birds flying through the cameras. So from these images, you can see that the, the shape of the birds is clearly distinguishable. So we are able to measure both the body and the location of the wing. And this is how, how we set up the camera in the field. So uh, the bird species we are interested in is uh, jackdaw and rook. Both the, both the bird species is belong to covered family. So they are social animal. So in, during the daytime, they, they will spend the uh, time to, in, the, in the town to find the food. And in the later afternoon, they, the birds will gather together and fly towards the trees where they spend the night. So, uh, and the, the flying path of the birds is very predictable. So we could have set up the cameras in the farm uh, just above the flying, just below the fly path to capture the motion of the birds. And uh, so one very important problem is how do you solve the optical occlusion problem. So because the birds, they have very high coronary motion and they may fly very close to each other. So uh, you, you may have some situation when two birds, they form an overlap image on camera one. So as you heard in uh, yesterday morning's talk, uh, they have developed some global optimization work to solve the occlusion problem. But here, since we can take advantage of the larger distance between camera, so the, the, well, even if you have overlap image on camera one, because the, the other camera has very, very, very different viewing angles, so we, the, the, the birds will not form overlap image on camera two. So we can take advantage of that to develop a simple algorithm to to solve the occlusion problem. So first of all, we just uh, uh, follow the simple one-to-one -one match, just uh, like for each detected bird on camera one to find, a, find a, uh, the match, match the one on camera two and uh, to detect uh, uh, the birds. So uh, after this step, you may see that there's still one bird that is missing. You, could, you haven't uh, using that information. So we could uh, do additional step like from, uh, searching the unmatched birds from the first one to find the unmatched birds, so we could recover the, uh, the missing birds. And then by combining these two steps, we are able to recover all the birds, and then we can track them in time to find the trajectory. And uh, so, as I mentioned, that we are able to 
measures the uh, shape of the birds. So, how, so now I'll go into to, uh, show you how we can measure both body and wing motion. So initially, we just detect the center of the birds uh, just based on the center of the shape. So that 2D location is coupled with both body and wing motion. So if you're using this 2D location to, capture, to calculate the 3D trajectory, you will find out that the trajectory has this wave package, have this high frequency wave motion. So then we can set a cutoff because the body motion is a, has a very relatively low frequency. However, the wave motion is a very high frequency. You could, you could set a cutoff frequency to, to, to get the body motion, and then you can subtract the body motion from this hole and to get the wind motion. Now you may ask the question, whether this body motion really captures the center of the bus? So we could project the 3D location back to the camera to see whether this really captures the, body, the center of the body. So ye yes, we do. We're really able, able to capture the center of the body. And now, uh, since we, cal we calculated the wind motion, we could do a continuous wavelet transform to get, to get the time-dependent wind beat frequency. So as you can see here, we, we, we clearly distinguish that the, the flapping motion, during the flapping motion, the wind beat frequency is about 5 hertz, and, the, and then the bus started to de, uh, decrease height into the gliding mode where the wind beat frequency is zero. So by doing this, we are able to measure the, around the 3D trajectory, we are able to measure the wind beat frequency, the time-dependent wind beat frequency. And the, uh, here I'm showing you a sample data with uh, 15 jackdaws flying through the tracking volume. So you saw that uh, uh, for each trajectory, we, we are able to measure the, time, the varying of the uh, shape. So I'm going to show you that because most early work about the birds about the collective motion of birds, they only depending on the position of velocity. They, so, but here, because since the wind motion is, this, is something which the birds could control, directly control, in response to environmental stimuli. So this may help, using wind motion may help us to better understand how the birds is response to other uh, environmental stimuli. So the first thing we can use the wind motion is to classify uh, the trajectory into different flying modes. So you have, so in, in this plot, I'm plotting the sem some simple trajectory, uh, uh, the changing of height as they traveling around. So we can look, and the, the, the color is uh, colored by the wind beat frequency. So uh, we, found, we found that the, uh, the birds can have uh, three flapping modes. So uh, by depending on the change of height, they could uh, fly in, uh, horizontally without changing height or clamping or di diving. And this, the birds can also uh, like, uh, uh, has non-flapping region, which, uh, which, which can also decrease in height or increase in height. For each fly, flying mode, we are able to calculate the flying speed and the wind beat frequency. And the second thing is that we, we are able to uh, maybe investigate a little bit about the wind aerodynamics in, in the field. Because uh, people have studied the wind aerodynamics in the laboratory, such as put the birds in, in the wind tunnel to study how the, how the lift, of, how the force is generated on the wing. And uh, they found out that as you increase, as, after you increase the speed above 10 meters per second, if you keep increasing the speed, they found out that the, the birds has to flap the wing much faster. It, that is because above 10 meters per second, if you keep increasing speed, the drag on the wing is, is, uh, becomes higher and higher, so the power is also increased. So, birds, so the birds has to flap the wing much faster. So, but however, such kind of experiment has never been performed. It's very hard to conform in the field. But all, here, since we can, we can measure the wind beat frequency, so we are able to confirm whether this experiment is true in the field, whether it's, it's uh, really happening in the field. So we plot the wind beat frequency as a function of the flying speed. We indeed confirm that as you're increasing the flying speed, the wind beat frequency also increases. The second thing is that we are a, uh, the wind motion may able to tell us the response time between a pair of birds. So we found a, a pair of birds. So you have uh, these two trajectories. The birds A, 
first of all, it uh, clamping and then diving. Then the bird B just follow the path of the bird A. So you may ask, how, what's the response time? What's the time lag between B and A? So in the previous work, people have used determine the delay time based on the acceleration of velocity correlation. So from here, if you plot the acceleration, you could look at the peak location of the, when the birds have the highest radial acceleration to determine the delay time. And uh, in both methods, that tells you a delay time about 0.3 seconds. But however, the velocity and acceleration is a consequence of how the birds change the wind motion or change the body posture. So this is a consequence of how the birds changing the wind motions. It may not tell you how fast the response. So here, because we are able to measure the wind motion, so we could directly measure the, how fast the, the response. So from here, you could see that the red one, if you look very carefully, you'll find that the bird A stop flap its wing, but however, the bird B has to finish a whole wing beat cycle, then it stops the wind motion. So the delay time is, uh, if you look at the wind beat frequency, it also tells you that the delay time is about one wind beat circle, cycle. So, it tell, so, it's, it's, uh, and, uh, so the first of all, it's, uh, the delay time is about 0.3 seconds. They, are, they all match with each other. This is uh, good news. The, the more important thing is that maybe you could, uh, it tells you that how fast a bird can respond to its neighborhood. It's, uh, it depends on how fast it could flap its wing. If the, if the bird has higher wind beat frequency, it, tell, it may indicate that the bird could respond faster. So, and the second thing, uh, uh, the, the third thing you can ask is, is whether flying in group could save energy. So, uh, for, so in this well-organized group uh, formed by snow geese, uh, some people have shown that the birds in the behind could actually take, the, take advantage of the upward wind motion generated by the birds in the front to save energy. However, in this randomly organized group, whether the birds could save energy or not, this is questionable. But, and we could confirm that, we could actually check that. By, so we plot the wind beat frequency as a function of local density. The local density is uh, calculated by how many neighborhood birds around me. So we found out as you increase in the local density, like if you have more birds around me, the wind beat frequency also increase. However, the, the flying speed doesn't increase. So it, it may indicate that flying in group may not save energy for this randomly organized group. Now we can uh, uh, move on to ask the question why flying in group couldn't save energy in this randomly organized group. So we are able to, we calculated the acceleration as a function of local density. And we found out that the birds in, as you increase in local density, the birds, the acceleration has also to increase. That means and the, we could, decomp, we could uh, decouple the acceleration in the direction that uh, around the flying direction and in the direction normal to the flying direction. And we found out most of the acceleration is due to the acceleration normal to your fly, flight direction. That means the birds in more dense group has to make more turns to avoid collision into the, some other birds. So that, that's, that maybe tells you why flying in this group, in this randomly organized group, uh, doesn't save energy. Maybe also cause energy, cause uh, like increase energy. And the last thing we can use wind beat frequency is that, as I told you before, we, we have two different bird species. One is jackdaw, another is look. If you just uh, look very carefully along about the, how the bird shape looks like, it's very, maybe it's very, a little hard to determine which one is which. Now, because since, since we can measure the wind beat frequency, maybe we could use the wind beat frequency to identify the birds. So we, we, we uh, uh, did some more experiment to measure some, to measure some isolated uh, pairs of uh, isolated uh, uh, jackdaws and rooks. We, we identified that indeed the rooks and the jackdaws, they have different uh, wind beat frequency. So this may indicate that we, we, we may be able to use the wind beat frequency to identify the birds in this flock. Uh, so now uh, I'm going to move forward. Like we, we also have some data with a, a flock with about 200, more than 200 birds. And uh, so we found out, so this is around the, the X one is around the flying direction and the, 
x3 is the gravity direction. And uh, we saw that uh, the, 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 the birth as the flying traveling uh, around, the, the, the distribution is not homogeneous. Instead, they form some subgroups around the flying direction. You saw that the subgroup one or subgroup two. And this, this, the subgroup, they are connected by some, some bus located in between. So you may ask the question, how, whether this is two subgroups, they are interacting with each other or not. So uh, we, we, we actually perform the velocity co uh, correlation and analyze to, to look at the velocity correlation of the velocity fluctuation. So in this plot, we plot the velocity fluctuation subgroup one or subgroup two, or you could do the analysis for the entire group. And in this plot, you show that the blue one is corresponding to this blue curve. You could say that as, the, as you increase the subgroup size, the correlation length also increase. And the more, import, more interesting is that if you treat the two subgroup as a whole, the correlation length even increase much larger than the subgroup size. So it, it, it may tell you that the two subgroups is really interact with each other. So the next step we are going to do is we are, we are trying to understand how does the information transfer from the first group to the second group. So this is what we are going to do now, uh, in the future. And the, uh, a second, so we, uh, the, this is a very special uh, case for the, uh, uh, for the coward family because you, you will always see a pair of birds flying very close to each other. That is because uh, in this covered family, they, you are, this pair of birds, is, uh, they have very, a lifetime, a lifelong time social relationship. This pair of birds is a, maybe belong, come from a same family, which is a father and a mother. So the, you may ask the question, maybe the pair of birds have much stronger interaction between, within the pairs compared to the rest of the group. And uh, such, 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 a, such a kind of heterogeneity, how this heterogeneity will affect the global, global structure or local interaction is questionable. So we are, we are, this is also what the, the, the second direction we are going to do. And uh, the, uh, we, we have some, performed some preliminary analyze, analyze. Like we, you could look at the, the first neighborhood relative position, like uh, uh, surrounding me. So if the theta is 90 degrees, it means it's uh, on my side. If it's, uh, uh, zero or 180 degrees in my front or back. So, the more, so you could say that some, if you, for some birds which is a pair, so the distribution is more anthropic. So the more anthropic the distribution is, it means that you have much stronger interaction. So we really come from that the pair of birds have much stronger interaction compared to the birds that is not a pair. So, and the next thing we are going to do is we are trying to find out whether this uh, local heterogeneity interaction will affect the global structure. And uh, so I put the conclusion here that we develop a portable system that is able to measure both body and wing motion. And I show you that if we're using the wing motion, we're able to better characterize the bird's behavior in the nature. And then we, we, uh, I also show you some, some effect, some heterogeneity effect on the global behavior. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, thanks all for your attention, and I'd like to take any question you might have. Any questions?